Hello, and welcome to the Center for Critical and Cultural Theory. My name is Dr. Roger Green. This is going to be a contextualized reading for Shakespeare's Twelfth Night, Act One. Uh, I already did an introductory lecture just about the play in general, but there's some introductory material to do for Act One as well. Um, so it might take me a couple of videos to get through Act One. There's a lot going on in Act One of this play. And uh, as I share my screen here, I want to point folks to um, a couple of paintings from uh, just before Shakespeare was born. So this is from the, the era anyway. I mean, here's a painting by Titian from... Uh, 1556 to 1559. You can find these on um, just like Wikipedia or Google image searches. <clears throat> if you want to get better looks than you, um, you're getting from the screen here. Um, and so I want to frame my opening of the play around this story um, that comes from uh, Greek and Roman contexts. Um, of Diana and Acteon. And so I'm going to, in doing so, I'm actually going to read from Ovid's Metamorphosis um, as well. So uh, Ovid is a Roman poet um, who's living um, in the years, I mean, just like we can think of it as like the, the century or uh, be, like before uh, current era or before Christ, if you want to think about. Um, there's a little bit of overlap in there, but that's about the time period. Not going to do much context on Ovid here, <laughs> but Ovid does tell us the story of Acteon. So I'm just going to read from the Metamorphosis. This is book three, um, and uh, um, I'll just, I'm jumping into the middle of, a, of, of one of his books here. Upon a mountainside whose woodland cover woodland coverts were stained with many a kill of varied game the shining noon had narrowed all the shade and midway at his zenith stood the sun then young Acteon was content he called his comrades as they roamed the lonely woods come friends our nets are wet our javelins drip with our quarry's blood today has brought success enough tomorrow when the dawn on uh, on saffron wheels leads on another day we'll start our work again now the sun shines halfway up his journey and his rays crack the parched countryside take up your nets here let us end the work and uh, end the work in hand the men obeyed his words and rested from their toil there was a valley clothed in hanging woods of pine and cypress named uh, Gargaphy, sacred to the chaste Diana, huntress queen. Deep in its farthest comb, framed by the woods, a cave lay hid, not fashioned by man's art, but nature's talent copied artistry. For in the living limestone, she had carved a na natural arch, and there a limpid spring flowed lightly babbling into the wide pool, its waters girdled with a grassy sward. Here, tired after the hunt, the goddess loved her nymphs to bathe to, um, to bathe her with the water's balm. Reaching the cave, she gave her spear and quiver and bow unstrung to the attendant nymph, Others received her robes over their arms, two loosed their, her sandals, more expert than these um, crocale tiled, uh, tied and than these crocale tied the hair loose on her shoulders into a knot, her own hair falling free. Then Nephili and Hyale um, and Rhenus and Fiale and Sacus Bought, brought the water in brimming jars and poured it over her, um, while um, Titania bathed her bathed there in the pool, her loved familiar pool. It chanced, Acteon, the day's hunt finished, idly wandering through unknown clearings of the forest, found the sacred grove, so the fates guided him. 
and came upon a cool, damp cave. At once, seeing a man all naked as they were, the nymphs beating their breasts filled the whole grove with sudden screams and clustered round Diana to clothe her body with their own. But she stood taller, a head taller than them all. And as the clouds are colored when the sun glows late and the low or like um, the crimson dawn, so deeply blushed Diana, caught unclothed. Her troop pressed close about her, but she turned aside and looking backwards, uh, would she had her arrows ready, all she had, the water, uh, she seized and flung it in the young man's face. And as the avenging downpour drenched his hair, she added words that warned of doom. Now tell you saw me here naked without my clothes, if you can tell at all. With that one threat, antlers she raised upon his dripping head, lengthened his neck, pointed his ears, transformed his hands into hooves, arms to long legs, and draped his body with dabbled hide, and left uh, and last set terror in his heart. Actaeon fled, royal Actaeon, the, and marveled in his flight as the new leaping sp at, at his new leaping speed. But when he saw his head and antlers mirrored in the stream, he tried to say, "Alas!" But no words came. He groaned. That was his voice. The tears rolled down on his cheeks, uh, on on cheeks not his. Uh, all changed except his mind. What should he do? Go home, back to the palace, or stay in hiding in the forest? Uh, shame forbade the first decision, fear the other. While thus he stood in doubt, his hounds had seen him. Blackfoot and Tracker first gave tongue, wise Tracker, a Cretan hound, Blackfoot, a Spartan breed. Swift as the wind, the rest came rushing in, glance, glutton, ranger, all from Arcady, fierce rover, sturdy stalker, moody storm, flight unsurpassed for speed, hunter for scent, bold woodman lately uh, wounded by a boar, dingle, a slender bitch sired by a wolf, snatch with pup with two pups gaunt catch from um, Sicyon, and shepherd one... Uh, once a guardian of her flock, Spot, Nasher, Tigress, Courser, Lightfoot, Strong, Dark Coated, Sooty, Blanche with snowy hair, Wolf with her nimble brother um, Cyprian, uh, Huge stalwart Spartan, Tempest never tired, Clench his dark forehead crowned with a white star, Blackie, a rough coated, coated shag, uh, couple of hounds born of Cretan sire and Spartan dam, fury and white tooth, barker, noisy bitch, and many more to long to tell. <laughs> Those are all just the names of the dogs. The pack, hot in pursuit, sped over the fells and crags by walls of rock on daunting trails or none. He fled where often he'd followed his, in pursuit, fled his own folk for shame. He longed to shout, I'm Actaeon, look, I'm your master. Words failed his will, their bang filled the sky. Black hair bit first, a wound deep in his haunch. Next killer, climber fastened on his shoulder. These started late, but cut across the, heel, the hills and gained a lead. Uh, they held their master down till the whole pack united sank their teeth into his flesh. He gave a wailing scream, not human, yet a sound no stag could voice. And filled with anguished cries, the mountainside he knew so well. Then, suppliant on his knees, turned his head silently from side to side, like arms that turned and pleaded. But his friends, with their glad, usual shouts, cheered on the pack, not knowing what they did, and looked around to find Actaeon, each louder than the rest, calling Actaeon as though he were not there, and blamed his absence and his sloth that missed the excitement of the kill. Hearing his name, he turned his head, would that he were indeed absent, but he was there. 
would that he watched not felt the hounds his hounds fear savagery now they were all around him tearing deep their master's flesh the stag that is no stag and not until so many countless wounds had drained away his lifeblood was his wrath it's said of, of chase Di diana satisfied as the tale spread views varied some believed diana's violence unjust some praised it as proper to her chaste virginity both sides found reason for their point of view <laughs> that's a nice ending there by Ovid. uh so i i open this uh talk about act one of twelfth night because the imagery of Acteon and the hounds being turned back against him uh, is going to be controlling throughout the play itself. Um, so we're going to want to pay attention to a theme that's, you know, varied throughout Renaissance literature in general, um, late medieval literature as well, um, uh, that is sometimes referred to as the hunt of love, that when we're talking about a love story or a love triangle, there's a hunter who's going after their beloved, who's who's the the one that they're hunting. We still use some of this, these metaphors in talking about love and relationships in the 21st century. Um, but it was a whole sort of rhetorical theme. And we know that um, also there's an element of reversal going on in the metamorphosis in this um, uh, tale. So Acteon is this, you know, a, acclaimed, you know, famous hunter, um, but he has become the prey and it's through diana right the goddess diana <clears throat> um, or artemis um uh, and so we want to pay attention to the ways that um references or literary allusions uh to that story might be showing up in the play okay so let's jump in and you know I, i'll probably get interrupted i've uh um sometime in this uh um video and then i'll just stop and then pick up again with another one um so we open with duke orsino in twelfth night or what you will already covered that stuff in the earlier lecture um and there's this meditation on art and music itself in the opening phrases remember from the earlier lecture that orsino because of his um noble state because he's upper class he's going to be speaking in verse it's going to be mostly iambic pentameter um and he says if music be the food of love play on give me excess of it that surfeiting the appetite may sicken and so die that strain again and it had a dying fall oh it came over my ear like the sweet south that breathes upon a bank of violets, stealing and giving odor. Enough, no more. Tis not so sweet now as it was before. He's asking for, keep playing this music, you can play that song again, but like in the, the, the moment is lost, right? So um, he says, then the music stops. So somebody's playing music for him, right? In the opening, uh, <clears throat> the music stops. O oh, spirit of love, how quick and fresh art thou, that notwithstanding thy capacity receiveth as the sea, naught enters there of what validity and pitch soe'er, but falls into abatement and low price even in a minute. So full of shapes is fancy that it alone is high fantastical. So I think that there's a lot of pregnancy into the words here that are opening the text um uh about not just love but about muses about inspiration and about art itself um of course these are actors on stage so they're in the midst of doing art and so uh, we in the audience if you imagine that as you're reading the play um are put in almost immediately into a state of irony remember from the earlier lecture dramatic irony is defined by the fact that the we the audience know more or can see more than the actors on stage so we can see tension um showing up where maybe characters can't see them um uh, from within their own individual perspectives curio then one of orsino's um uh servants here says 
Will you go hunt, my lord? What curio? The heart. Why so I do the noblest that I have? Oh, when mine eyes did see Olivia first, methought she purged the air of pestilence. That instant I was turned into a heart, and my desires like fell like fell and cool hounds ere since pursue me. Right there, right there. It's very subtle, but it's very obvious once we've heard the Acteon stuff. So here's an image of um, uh, um, Diana um, bathing in Acteon, seeing him. Um, here's another one um, from around the same time, the same artist here. Acteon's back here on the horse as well. And uh, the nymphs and Diana are bathing. Um, she's kind of looking over her shoulder there. And then we get um, also the death um, of uh, Acteon. And so this is showing Artemis, of course, or sorry, sorry Diana um, um, uh, shoot, shooting, but the dogs are attacking. That one's a little bit harder to see here. Um, so within Twelfth Night, um, look at the ways that um, Orsino takes the H-A-R-T, the heart, um, and... Um, uh, immediately turns it into his own chest, right? So he's playing with the homonym, he's playing with the phonetics of the sound um, and making a pun. Uh, but then he comes back to saying that he was transformed into a heart. So he's transformed into a deer and that crowns, sorry, um, cruel hounds uh, ever, er, ever since pursued me. And so he has become Acteon. He's been the person who's been in reversal. Um, and that's just being thematically set up right here at the beginning of the play. Uh, then Valentine, um, uh, the editors here note that, um, Kier Elam notes that uh, um, a lot of uh, characters in the play are named after saints. Um, as well, and martyrs, so Valentine being one of them here, um, Sebastian being another one that shows up later on in the play. Um, uh, Valentine enters, Orsino says, how now, what news from her? Valentine says, so please, my lord, I may not be admitted, but from her handmaid do return this answer. The element itself till seven years a uh, heat shall not behold her face at ample view, but like a cloistress, she will veiled walk and water once a day her chamber round with eye offending brine. All this to season a brother's dead love, which she would keep fresh and lasting in her sad remembrance. Orsino responds, Oh, she that hath a heart of that fine frame. So he's still on the heart theme, right? She that hath a heart of that fine frame to pay this debt of love but to a brother, how will she love when the rich golden shaft hath uh, killed the flock of all affections else that live in her? When liver, brain, and heart, these sovereign thrones are all supplied and filled uh, her sweet perfections with one self king. Away before me, to sweet beds of flowers, love thoughts lie rich when canopied with bowers. And they all exit. Okay, not going to be able to walk through every <laughs> bit of the play with this much intensity, but the opening scene here, act one, scene one, um, I think is really important for the rest of the play. Um, so we have that controlling theme showing up, excuse me, because my Expecting uh, my landlord is <laughs> uh, bringing uh, something into my apartment today, so uh, I might get interrupted. Um, uh, so we began with the acting on theme, and then and then the language itself is tying a concept like heart together. But we see that the concept is being um, the word, um, the plays on the word is showing up and pivoting through different meanings. Um, throughout the rest of of the of the scene here, um, and so this is what we might call, especially in music, motivic development. Right, you have a motive, you have a little idea, a little cell. It could be more than one word, but in this case, we're just dealing with heart, and it's changing and being repeated, and it repeats, but it's not always the same repetition. Right, that's what a motive is in music. Um, um, uh, thank you, Arnold Schoenberg, for uh, I'm thinking of his his writings on what a motive motive is. Uh, so 
in this last passage with Orsino here, he's still dealing with heart, but he takes it and he moves it to a more literal version. So not just a heart that's in love then moves it into the body and makes it materialize and makes it physical, but then he spreads it out and then he transfers it over to the idea of sovereignty itself. So let me read it again. Oh, she that hath a heart of that fine frame to pay this debt of love, but to a brother, how will she love when the rich golden shaft hath killed the flock of all affections else that live in her when liver, brain, and heart these sovereign thrones are all supplied and filled her sweet perfections with the one self king. Now he, of course, is the duke. He's he's a king as well. Too, so there's some punning going on there. Um, there's another being shot by the arrows of love here, but this is of course Cupid showing up. <clears throat> um, uh, there's also this idea of sovereignty or this idea of mastery that gets planted from this early scene. And that's going to be a theme showing up throughout the play. So there's the hunt of love theme going on, but there's also like the almost uh, um, bondage and discipline sort of language at times of, uh, of, of being one's willing servant to, to, to one's lo lover. We are in Illyria, um, which is, a, um, for all intents and purposes here, is, is, a, is a fictional land. It seems like Shakespeare has chosen this to be um, uh, intentionally fictional, not to, not to point to a specific place or spe specific time in history. And at the same time, it's a kind of mm, metaphor, perhaps, for the, the island of England. Uh, he is in love, or she knows in love with this woman who won't see him. She's lost her brother. She's in mourning. She's not seeing anybody, but Orsino is sending his servants to try and woo her or to try and get a sense of what's going on with her, believing that once her mourning period is over, he's going to step in and court her um, and, and win her heart. So act one point. Uh, act one, scene two, um, we shift to Viola um, on the beach with a captain and some sailors. Um, and uh, there has been a shipwreck. Uh, Viola says, what country, friends, is this? This is Illyria, lady. Viola says, uh, and what should I do in Illyria? My brother, he's in Elysium. Uh, so this is a reference to she thinks her brother's dead and that he's in the Elysian fields, right? Um, <clears throat> perchance he's not drowned. What think you, sailors? And the captain says, it is perchance that you yourself were saved. Oh, my poor brother. And so perchance he may, may he be. Uh, the captain goes on. True, madam, and to comfort you with the chance, assure yourself after our ship did split, when you and those poor, poor numbers saved with you hung on our driving boat, I saw your brother, most provident in peril, bind himself, courage and hope both teaching him the practice to a strong mast that lived upon the sea, uh, where, like Arion on the dolphin's back, I saw him hold acquaintance with the waves so long as I could see. So there's a couple things going on here. Um, as the notes in the bottom of the text will say, there's a shifting of the word per chance um, here that I'm not, I'm just not going to cover, but I'll just point it to the note. Um, and then the captain says, yes, this, yes, your brother may have lived. I saw him floating. He bound himself to a mast. The mast was floating on the sea. And he gives an image here of Arion on a dolphin's back. And this is going to signal to us um, particularly um, uh, uh, the month of February. So this is, again, kind of a reference to the time period that the um, play Twelfth Night would be given in as well. Um, and they've got a nice note about the, the dolphin stuff in the bottom. So I'm not going to cover that to you, just point to, you, to the text itself there. Um, uh, Viola is excited about this. She says, for saying so, here's gold. So she gives him gold. So we, we, we see that she has money, even though she's been shipwrecked. Um, uh, mine own escape unfoldeth to my hope, whereto thy speech serves for authority, the like of him. 
Knowest thou this country? I, madame, well, for I was bred and born not three hours travel from this very place. Who governs here? A noble duke. In nature as in name? Uh, what's his name? Avila says, an Orsino. Um, I've heard my father name him. He was a bachelor then. Um, uh, and this might be so... Um, uh, the captain says, and so he is now. So, so we, we learn that like right away that Duke Orsino is single, but partly what is going on, I think with Viola, who's not necessarily in love with him yet, um, but will become in love with him is that like, she can't go as a woman to go see a bachelor. It's considered improper. Um, uh, and because he doesn't have a wife, there's no wife who has ladies uh, um, ladies in wait attending her so there's not going to be a community of women for her to find herself in and that might be the setup for one of the the reasons why she disguises herself as a man um so the captain says um and so he is now or was so very late, but for but a month ago I went from hence, and then twas fresh and murmur, as you know, with what great ones do the less will prattle of, uh, so gossip, right, uh, that he did seek the love of fair Olivia. What's she? says Viola, a virtuous maid, the daughter of a count that died some twelve months since, and then leaving her in protection of his son, her brother, who shortly also died, for whose dear love they say she hath abjured the company and sight of men. Okay, so uh, Viola says, oh, that I served that lady and might be, not be delivered to the world till I had made my own, mine own occasion mellow um, what my estate is. And so yeah, there's this kind of uh, overwhelming feeling of Viola who's lost her own brother and she's in mourning if she could just go and be with Olivia. But of course, Olivia is not seeing anybody, um, says the captain here. Um, and so Viola gets this idea and it might be thinly disguised. It might be, uh, So if we think about the definitions of a farce from my earlier lecture, <laughs> um, it might not need that much explanation for why she decides to cross-dress. Um, uh, but here, here it is. She has the idea. Um, she asked the captain to keep her secret. And then she says, conceal me what I am and be on my aid for such a disguise as happily shall become the form of my intent. I'll serve this duke. Thou shalt present me as a eunuch to him. Uh, it may be worth thy pains, for I can sing and speak to him uh, in many sorts of music that will allow me very worth his service. What else may hap to, uh, to time I will commit? Only shape thou thy silence to my wit. So notice like she's um, uh, she's speaking from a higher position too. She's also using the thy, the familiar with the captain, right? Um, which um, uh, means that she's showing her position, her class position as being above him. Um, and she's saying that she has these um, arts of music and, and speaking. So this is some sort of, she's got talent. Um, the captain says, be you his eunuch and your mute I'll be. When my tongue blabs, then let mine eyes not see. So he agrees. Um, and he, the verse is continued here, right? Like the, we hear the rhyming couplets at the end. Um, I think the lead me on. And so then that's the end of uh, act one, scene two. Act one, scene three, where it shift to, so there's a lot of shifting just in this one particular act to completely new characters. So the audience is putting a lot together um, in a short amount of time here. And here we have Sir Toby, Sir Toby Belch um, and Maria. Uh, and look at the way that the language shifts to prose from poetry. Sir Toby says, what a plague means my niece to take the death of her brother thus. I'm sure cares an enemy to life. By my troth, Sir Toby, you must come in earlier o' nights. Your cousin, my lady, takes great exceptions to all to your ill hours. So the mundaneness of the speech, they're talking, talking about the comings and goings. Sir Toby is uh, drinking during this scene. Um, and that brings us into a whole different register of language. Uh, 
Maria, um, uh, why let her escape before, ex let her accept before accepted, excuse me. Maria says, I, but you must confine yourself within the modest limits of order. Confine? I'll confine myself no finer than I am. These clothes are good enough to drink in, and so be the boots too, and they be not let them hang themselves in their own straps. Um, that quaffing and drinking will undo you. So this kind of uh, excess, right? We know that this is a play that's being put on as people are being festive and drinking and having fun and there are role reversals going on. Um, uh, that quaffing and drinking well and do you, I heard my ladies talk of it yesterday and a foolish night that you brought in one night uh, here to be her wooer. Who, Sir Andrew uh, um, Agucheek? Um, uh, I, he, uh, he's as tall a man as any in Illyria. Um, and so we can we come to learn here. Uh, he's he has three thousand ducats a year. So what makes uh, um, Sir Ag Agucheek uh, knight is that he's bought himself into knighthood as well. Stephen Greenblatt. Um, notes that this is something that one could do if they had enough money in um, English society at the time, and it's something that Shakespeare seems to have done too. He's wanted to to um, uh, uh, raise the status of the Shakespeare family name. Seems to be something that Shakespeare himself was concerned with. Um, and so they go on talking about him um, being foolish and prodigal. Um, uh, they're basically drunks. It seems like Sir Toby wants his drunk friend to marry his niece so that he can have access to endless revelry and lots of money. Um, uh, uh, she says he's foolish and prodigal. Sir Toby says, fie that you will say so. He plays of the veal, the gamboys, and speaks three or four languages word for word without book and hath all the good gifts of nature. So he's as he's painting this picture of Agucheek being um, uh, um, refined and his taste being gentlemanly, being upper class. Um, and we will see something different when he shows up. Uh, Maria, he hath indeed almost natural, for besides that he's a fool, he's a great quarreler, quarreler and, uh, and but that he hath the gift of a coward to allay the gust he hath in the quarreling, tis thought among the prudent he would quickly have the gift of the grave. Um, so he gets in fights, he gets drunk, um, and he's not a good fighter once he gets into the fights, he's a coward. So this becomes a problem. Uh, by this time, by this hand, they were our scoundrels and subtractors that say so of him. Who are they? Says Toby. Like, I'll, you know, fight anybody who besmirches my friend's name. Uh, um, uh, and then Sir Andrew, uh, the exchange continues. Sir Andrew Agucheek enters as well. And the Ag, Ag, or Og, like, you know, this is like sickliness, right? So the, just the name of him, of of this awkward name that we have for this night is itself kind of humorous and speaks to the play, you know, pointing towards a farce again. Um, uh, uh, for here comes Sir Andrew Aguface. So he's already playing with um, with his name. Uh Sir Andrew says, Sir Toby Belch, now here now, sir, um, how now, Sir Toby Belch? Sweet Sir Andrew. Um, uh, sir Andrew turns to Maria, bless you, fair shrew. The note says that this is maybe a term of endearment in this particular case. And you too, she says, um, uh, a cost, Sir Toby, a cost. And so there's a bunch of play that um, shows up on the word with a cost and that that's going to do a bunch of work here um so engage with or a sale but also a cost in the sense of like a sex being sexually accosted going on and so there's a bunch of back and forth going on between uh sir andrew and maria in this particular section um uh, a lot of uh sexual innuendos going on um 
Uh, and 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 this, of course, coming from somebody who's supposed to be wooing um, the mistress of the house, Olivia. So like so, um, uh, a lot of uh, um, layers to the context here as well. Um, not necessarily the most savory of of guys. <laughs> um, uh, I am going to push through that section um, a little bit and get to. Um, about line 80 in Act scene, Act 1, Scene 3. Um, uh, Sir Toby keeps referring to Canary, a cup of Canary, which is a kind of wine um, from the Canary Islands. Um, uh, Mr. Andrew says, never in your life, I think, unless you see, uh, see Canary put me down, unless you see me too drunk. Methinks sometimes I have no more wit than a Christian or an ordinary man has. And he means just any sort of Christian and Christian society. Everybody in their society is Christian. So this is just like a way of saying everyday person. Um, he says, but I'm a great eater of beef, and I believe that it does harm to my wit. No question, says Sir Toby. And I thought, uh, and and I thought that I'd forswear it, or if I thought that I'd forswear it, I'll ride him home tomorrow, Sir Toby. Pourquoi, my dear knight? What is pourquoi? Do or not do? And if you know anything about French, so like French is pourquoi means why. I mean, and so Sir Toby has said, why, my dear knight? And Sir Andrew doesn't get the language thing. So what we're seeing is that earlier on when um, Sir Toby is talking up his friend, he knows all of these languages and all of this stuff um, that uh, Sir Andrew is really just kind of an idiot. Um, uh, I have bestowed that time in the tongues that I have in fencing, dancing, and bear baiting. Um, so this is a reference to bear baiting, which was a really cruel sport that was going on where they would capture bears. And it was a popular sport, um, gruesome as it was, um, that um, uh, took place on the outskirts of London during the time that Shakespeare was writing. Where people would go capture bears um, and chain them up and then basically pe they, people would torture them the people would piss off the bear try and get it to react and do all sorts of scary things for the crowd and eventually they kill the the poor bear um uh it was even considered cruel um at the time as well so it's considered it's very kind of like the lowest kind of form of gross entertainment and so um, mixing up bear baiting with fencing and dancing and speaking different languages shows that that uh, he's a lower class person. Uh, um, then we get some, uh, you know, the talk about the hair um, as well. Uh, Um, and Sir Andrew says, like, you know, you, Olivia is not interested in me, so I'm going to go home. Um, and Sir Toby is, keeps saying, you know, no, don't go away. And he doesn't want him to go away because he's got a bunch of money, right? And they can go out partying together all the time. And um, Sir Andrew's going to flip the bill. Um, uh, Sir Andrew says, the Count himself here hard woos her. Um, and Sir Toby says, she'll not, she'll none of the count. She'll not match above her degree, neither in her estate, years nor wit. I have heard her swear it. Tut, there's life in it, in, in it, man. Um, and so this is, this is something that's pointed out by the editors as well. This, this tut, 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 that, that kind of language is definitely um, in the prose register of language. Um, well, you'll also see um, at times that Sir Toby refers to Sir Andrew as the with the thy, so um, uh, or with the thou, the intimate. So, um, so he's using a dimin diminutive way of talking down to Sir Andrew as he talks to him. Art thou good at these um, um, uh, kick shosses, knight? Um, <clears throat> as any man in Illyria whatsoever he be under the degree of my betters, and yet I will not compare with an old man. What is thy excellence in a galliard knight? Uh, faith, I can cut a, I can cut a caper, and I can cut the mutton to it too. <clears throat> They're playing on puns for dancing. I can cut a caper. 
Um, and then mutton uh, is reference to the food mutton, and it's also being referenced uh, a reference to women's genitals. Uh, uh, so there's a lot of of sexual humor going on in the text here. It's like lowbrow humor showing up. Uh, um, uh, and then they're dancing back and forth. So they're kind of partying, they're dancing. Um, Sir Toby says, wherefore are these things hid? Wherefore have these gifts a, a curtain before them? Are they like to take to dust like Mistress Maul's picture? Why dost thou not go to church in a galliard and come home in a coranto? Something like dancing one way, dancing the, uh, the next way. My very walk should be a jig. I would not look so much uh, as make water, but in a sink apace make water pee right so they're, they're basically doing all of these different kinds of dances right um and you can see that the actors on stage would be moving in different ways now i'm doing a jig now i'm doing the galliard now i'm doing the coranto um and then also you know gesturing to peeing um as, as well which of course is you know they have to pee because they're drinking a lot uh so what does that mean it's a world um uh it's a world to hide virtues in I did think by the excellent constitution of thy leg, it was formed under the star of the galliard. Aye, um, tis strong as they're the referring to legs, they're referring to mutton. There's also double entendres for uh, their own genitals going on as well here. Um, uh, Sir Toby mistakes the idea um, uh, 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 that the reference that they're born under Taurus, which Sir Toby is saying that this uh, the neck and and um, throat, so it's for about drinking. Um, but Sir Toby, Sir Andrew shows um, that he misses the joke again, and they go off dancing. End of Act One, Scene Three. Shift back over um, to Valentine and Viola. So time has passed here. We we find out like the, a few days have passed by, and we've just skipped the whole sort of scenario of Viola introducing herself. Um, uh, she's dressed as Cesario here. So I'll switch and I'll use I'll switch the gender term to he as well for um, Viola when she's dressed as Cesario. Something we want to pay attention to is that. Um, uh, um, pronoun usage here. So uh, Valentine, one of the Duke's um, servants, says, if the Duke continues these favors towards you, Cesario, you are like to be much advanced. So we already know that like Cesario has made a good impression, right, on Duke Orsino and seems to be a favorite. Um, uh, remember, Cesario has um, uh, said that he is a eunuch right that he's had his genitals removed and that's what accounts for um the higher pitch in voice um with um uh um and with a youthful appearance perhaps um viola says um so the text is calling it viola in the in the side here but um cesario is is who viola is is dressed as so um uh, Cesario says, you either fear his humor or my negligence that you call in question the continuance of his love. He's inconstant, sir, in his favors. No, believe me. So the servants are sort of noticing kind of favoritism that the Duke has towards um, Cesario. Um, but uh, Cesario knows that he keeps talking about how he's in love only with uh, Olivia. So right there, there's already this kind of blend, like, well, aren't you his um, eunuch servant, right? But there's already this kind of uh, tension or ambiguity about the romance going on. Uh, Orsino comes in and uh, he um, asks for Cesario and, he's, uh, and he then asks Cesario to go be his wooer to Olivia. He asks the other um, uh, attendants to step aside for a minute and says, Cesario, thou knowest um, less, uh, thou knowest no less but all. I have unclasped to thee the book, even my secret soul. Therefore, good youth, address thy gate unto her. Be not denied across, stand at her doors, and tell them where thy fixed foot shall grow till thou have audience. Now, just pay attention here to the way that he's using the metaphor of the book, 
he's unclasped like the book, like a diary of his heart, of his true feelings, because this is going to show up. Cesario is going to remember that metaphor when he shows up to talk to Olivia. Um, Cesario says, um, sure, my noble lord, if he be so abandoned, uh, if she be so abandoned to her sorrow as is as as it is spoke, she never will admit me. Be clamorous and leap all civil bounds rather than make unprofited return. <laughs> really pushing on Cesario here. Say I do speak with her, my lord. What then? Oh, then unfold the passion of my love. Surprise her with the discourse of my dear faith. It shall become thee well to act my woes. She will attend it better in thy youth than in annuncias of more grave respect and another person announcer's um, respect as well. And I want you to, I keep reading this stuff out loud, um, not because I'm the best reader in the world, but I want you to hear as the text is moving through. I want you to hear the difference between the prose and the poetry. I want you to hear the flow of the words um, as they come out as of of the the characters and how that maps onto their station. Um, so you can see um, the skill <laughs> that um, uh, Shakespeare has here. Just like I, I don't have time to lecture on Ovid this morning, but like. Ovid's metamorphosis is doing the same thing. If you read the metamorphosis, he's basically showing off the whole time as a poet just how fantastic he can tell these tales, right? So that long hyperbole, right? And hyperbole is the rhetorical word for exaggeration, right? When that long, just the listing of all the dogs' names, dog, and, and he's building up tension. He's building up tension. They're all going after Acteon, right? Um <clears throat> Shakespeare's doing his own kind of showing off as a writer and his ability to show, to write across class um, and his ability to carry metaphors over from one act to another. So those sometimes they're co-controlling metaphors, such as the hunt of love, which show, throws, shows up throughout the play. Sometimes they're very, very specific metaphors, like the heart being a book metaphor, which I've already said will show up later on in the act. Gender ambiguity keeps showing up here. Um, so um, Orsino is again talking to Cesario and says, Dear lad, believe it, for they shall let yet be lie thy happy years um, that say thou art a man. Diana's lip, remember, that's reference to <laughs> Acteon, right? And um, Diana's lip is not more smooth and rubious, but Diana, of course, is a goddess of virginity as well. So we're already seeing this eunuch being compared to a goddess um we're also we also know what has happened to Acteon from uh the Ovid play and we know that Duke Orsino has positioned himself as Acteon earlier on with reference to the heart situation um this is the tightness of the composition that Shakespeare is able to do for us as a writer um, there are various motifs that show up over and over again, and they can be as simple as one word metaphor, heart, H-A-R-T for H-E-R-T, H-E-A-R-T. They can be as elaborate as an allusion to a Roman story or Roman narrative and poetry. Um, they can be as low-browed as peeing and farting and, and, uh, um, drinking jokes and um, revelry. Um, uh, he's showing us that he can do everything here. Um, Diana's lip is not more smooth and rubious. Thy small pipe is as the maiden's organ, shrill in sound, and is all semblative a woman's part. I know thy constellations is right apt for this affair. All of this gender ambiguity, and we know in the audience that um, of course, if you're in Shakespeare's time, you already know that it's uh, an actor who's playing viola, but it's, it's a male actor playing viola, the female who then is playing the male um, or the eunuch here, um, but still male, I guess, um, uh, if we're talking about sex and not gender. Um, uh, and yet um, the language itself of the play is 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 
has this sexual tension going on. Um, it's definitely homoerotic, no matter how you look at it, whether you're talking about the actual actors on stage being men or whether you're talking about um, the fact that Orsino is clearly being um, homoerotic to um, uh, um, Cesario, whom he believes to be um, a, a eunuch. Um, and and different scholars are going to sort of point to different like layers of acceptability in terms of sexual behavior um, and homosexuality it wouldn't necessarily be the this kind of a ways that 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 maybe uh, some people want to see it in terms of black and white um, in our current society. Um, there's a lot you know whole bodies of literature on that sort of stuff. But I think that we just as readers here, you know, the first time you're reading the play, you just want to see that the sexual ambiguity is itself sexy and that's what's going on in the in the play um uh and then so the other attendants come in um some four or five attend him all if you will for i myself am best when le least in company and then he says to um cesario prosper well in this and thou shalt live as freely as thy lord Again, the thy is being used, right? So Duke Orsino uses the familiar um, and um, uh, this is a diminutive stance. Um, Thou shalt live as freely as thy Lord to call his fortunes thine. There's also even that ambiguity of like, if you do well in this, you're gonna share my fortunes with me, um, which uh, rings differently I'm almost like we're going to be man and wife or something like that but of course it would be man and man um <clears throat> uh, so sorry I says I'll do my best to woo your lady and then turns aside and says yet a barful strife wooer as I woo myself would be uh his wife um I'm going to stop there because it's been over an hour for this video or it's getting close to an hour um, and so we're going to stop at Act 1.4. We'll pick up with Act 1.5 in the next video. Have a great day, um, uh, night or morning, wherever you are. Thanks for listening.